Okay. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, another episode of Tech Terra's uh, webinar series on eco friendly landscaping. I'm glad you're here tonight. Um, our guest tonight is Steve Recky, who, who's with the Rutgers Extension Service. Steve and I have known each other for a long time, <laughs> two decades or so. Um, he, he was kind of instrumental in a lot of things that I learned. But before I took any of Steve's talks and classes, um, you know, I, I think I've mentioned in the past, but I, I ran a spray division for a tree care company where we had 10 1,000 gallon spray rigs going out every day and just throwing all the chemicals in the tank together and spraying everything on the property. Um, once I left that company, I went on to another one that was a little more eco-friendly and it was more, uh, more tempered in spot treatment. But uh, what really changed it for me was taking Steve's, um, he used to give a was that, three or four day course on uh, IPM practices for in the landscape and through those courses, I learned that a lot of things we were doing were just plain stupid. And they, they did not help, help the health of the trees and they certainly did not help the health of the planet. Um, one story I'll tell before I hand it over to Steve and I, I tell this one all the time, but- um, Oh no, you're not gonna tell this story again, are you Barry? Yeah, you gotta listen <laughs> to you. <laughs> Um, oh, please go ahead. So I'm sorry. Part part of the deal with that course was after you went through the you know three or four days, um, Steve would come out and spend some time with you in in the field uh, doing your job. So I, at that time, I was working for a tree care company in Princeton, and we had a lot of upscale clients and stuff. And we at that time we would actually scout the property first and decide what we would be treating and that that was a big forward step from the previous company um so anyway we're scouting the the um property uh, knocked on the door and and the uh, uh person said oh can you can you spray that tulip tree because our our limousine is parked under there and there's all kind of sooty mold under it so okay we went over and took a look at it and normally i would have sprayed the tree it was a 60 foot tulip tree and Steve said, you know, take a closer look here because, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's covered with aphids and that's the problem. However, there's a lot of ladybug larvae and they eat the aphids. So let's, let's wait a while, come back in a week. So I knocked back on the door, told them what we're doing. I said, you know, you can move the limousine to the other driveway you have and, you know, I'll come back. I'll take care of the other things, but um, I'll come back in a week or so and see if it needs to be sprayed. Sure enough, I came back a week, there, there was, all the aphids were gone, eaten up by the ladybug. So um, it, it was good for the tree, it was good for the environment. Um, and, and by the way, they still paid for it. <laughs> so with that, I, I'm gonna hand it over to Steve. Again, Steve, thank you very much for taking some time out and doing this. All right, sure enough. Well, thank you, Barry. And yeah, I always say that aphids, at least in the landscape, are junior varsity pests, uh, you know, people pay too much attention to them. Different story in nurseries and greenhouses, uh, but in the landscape, we can often tolerate them. And, and as long as the beneficials come in and there's a lot more than just lady beetles. Uh, so anyway, my name is uh, Steve Rutke, as has been stated, and uh, I work with Rutgers Cooperative Extension. And um, what I do now is I do a, monitoring as well as a consulting service for greenhouse and nursery growers. I usually select uh, a handful of them. So I visit one or two of them every day of the week. And I start uh, with greenhouse in the spring and then I finish up with nurseries all through the summer and into the fall. Uh, initially what Barry and I, what he was talking about, Rutgers had a, a landscape IPM mentoring program where I was, uh, not the originator of the program, I was more of a field coordinator and I would work with the landscapers on site with their, usually on their clients' uh, landscapes. And we'd go over things like uh, monitoring and decision-making and making sure they, they knew that the insects and the diseases and other problems that plants have. And uh, that's what Barry and I did uh, for I think five visits for about three hours each visit. So we got to know each other and that was, uh, 
probably a little over 25 years ago. So anyway, uh, this is a very fundamental talk. It's really, it's just uh, the whole IPM philosophy is something that's been around for quite some time now. Uh, landscape IPM came, came in on the late side, but there's been, uh, you know, IPM in fruit uh, orchards and also vegetables and uh, regular row crop farming. So uh, landscape kind of came in uh, in the late, uh, probably the late 80s, early 90s. And even in the mid 90s, it was still kind of a cutting edge thing. And a lot of the commercial landscape companies were not quite certain about this whole IPM. And they were familiar with the this philosophy, this concept, but they didn't necessarily know how to in implement it. And more importantly, could they make a profit doing it? And uh, so anyway, let me start off with a story. And this, these are Vidalia beetles, which are a type of lady beetle species. And they were not native here in, in North America. They were found feeding in Australia and New Zealand. And what had the problem though in California was these cottony cushion scales. Is shown there, and they are a piercing, sucking insect, and they were causing a reduction of yield with the citrus groves in Southern California and with various parts, of, and presently today in parts of South Texas and Florida as well. And these cottony cushion scales are a problem there. But what they did back uh, about 1888, I think it was the year when they brought these beetles that they discovered in. Australia and they they said well maybe you know these are doing a pretty good job of controlling this scale over in that part of the world let's go ahead and bring them over here and release them to see if they can uh, work as well you know that's it could be a gamble doing that you know you don't know what necessarily any kind of side effect take place and so but they did attempt it and it seemed to work and there were no side effects whatsoever and it did a great job. Actually, it didn't eliminate the cottony cushion scales, but it reduced their populations to a significant level where it was very satisfactory to the uh, citrus groves. You know, back then, uh, you know, over 100 years ago, they didn't have a lot of insecticides that were available to use. And so this, what's now, it's called a classical biological control where you're bringing an insect from another part of the world. But, you know, it's something you don't just randomly do without a lot of research and which is done today with some of these exotic pests we're dealing with, and they're trying to bring in, you know, uh, non-native beneficials over to see if they could control these exotics that we have now. But that can't be done just without a lot of preparation and research and planning, because we don't know the side effects that does occur on occasions. So, uh, so that was a great success story, and uh, it worked out just fine. However, something did happen. Uh, and so when we attempt to eradicate uh, a pest, uh, it's difficult to do. And then during the, uh, especially toward the end of the 1940s after the World War II and the, the petrochemical industry really began to develop these, uh, these uh, 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 chlorinated hydrocarbons. Uh, one of the best examples would be DDT. It's very infamous. And so this was made available to the uh, citrus grove uh, in the industry there. And they started, they said, well, sure, these beetles do a pretty good job, but why don't we use this DDT and we'll completely eliminate the problem. Well, they, they did use it and it worked remarkably well. And it did knock down the cottony cushion scale even further than the, the beetles did. But of course you could probably guess what did it do to these uh, Vidalia beetles? Yeah, it just pretty much wiped them out. And so they said, well, that's, that's too bad, but we just, we got this chemical and we just keep applying it. And, you know, back in the earlier years, they didn't have a good understanding of how insects were developing resistance. And they started using this same active ingredient uh, year after year after year. And it actually didn't take that many years, uh, you know, five or 10 years. And they started to notice uh, that the material wasn't working as well. The DDT wasn't killing the cottony cushion scale as well as it did previously. And what was happening is the, the scales were developing a resistance to it. And so it got to the point where it got uh, not, not even a very effective method of control any longer. And so they had to stop using the DDT and they went back again. And this is the uh, US uh, Department of Agriculture went back to Australia and they gathered up some more of these Vidalia beetles and they re-released them 
again and try not to kill them this time. And uh, even today, if you go into a citrus grove and you talk about Vidalia beetles, and I'm sure most of the growers will tell you, yeah, they're very valuable and we want to protect them, even though they do use pesticides, but they try not to, to kill off all the lady beetles. And that's just this specific species of lady beetles that was very effective against that, that particular type of scale. So uh, yeah, we, we, that's the problem we have with our broad spectrum type chemicals and uh, DDT is kind of the introduce uh, in a hard way, a hard lesson learned in the agricultural field about what happens when you overuse an active ingredient of an insecticide again and again. And I think we understand how resistance works. Those of you who do pesticide applications and if you read the label, oftentimes there'll be resistant management uh, requirements that have to be followed. So uh, when we use pesticides, uh, we have a couple of principles we need to follow. And one of them is just treat only when necessary. And you might say, well, that's common sense, but uh, you know, Barry and I were active uh, in the landscape uh, you know, in the 1980s when we were kind of thought of almost exterminators. And we weren't thought of being as landscape managers so much, at least many of uh, the more chemically orientated uh, spray companies the clients they had, they they thought, you know, that's we we're giving them a protective chemical umbrella around their landscape, and we really weren't doing that. And uh, that's an important thing uh, to try to remember is that we only need to apply the chemicals where it's necessary, and 100% control is not required to prevent economic and aesthetic loss. This is especially true in the landscape. Now, I do work in nursery and greenhouse, and there, what's called action thresholds are pretty low because they can't be shipping uh, to especially out of state uh, to areas with plants that have certain you know, insects on them. That's just gonna be probably rejected and returned to the uh, nursery grower or greenhouse grower. And then that's gonna be a, a cost that they have to uh, you know, bear themselves. And so they do have to keep their, their pests quite low or they, otherwise they, they you know, risk being rejected. Okay. Not the case with landscape. And so this just indicates there is a threshold, a pest density threshold that's somewhat acceptable. And this is maybe more true in the landscape, as I already stated. And it's shown here that, you know, when you have low pest density, this uh, XY graph on the X axis, when the pest densities are really quite low, uh, the, the crop value is maybe at its highest. And then as the pest density increases, then the, the crop value or the aesthetic appeal of the landscape plants begins to decline. And it's been shown through surveys by residential homeowners, and so this would be residential landscape clients, uh, that they can accept maybe five to 10% damage. And this is research out of the University of Maryland that was done. They're one of the leaders in landscape IPM during the early decades of this whole philosophy. But that's what they discovered, uh, you know, people can tolerate that five to 10% damage. So we don't need to have 100% control. In fact, you know, sometimes uh, if someone wants to get 100% control, I mean, that's, that's really not management, uh, that's revenge. <laughs> You're trying to kill the very last uh, problem or insect on the property. That's not the, the way it should work. So I think I need to emphasize the fact that, you know, this talk I'm giving is, has a, an entomological bias to it. You know, IPM includes, uh, you know, the plants themselves and then a lot of cultural practices that have to be done, a concept that's called uh, plant healthcare. And uh, so I do have a bit of a bias with the entomological aspect of it. And when IPM first began to be promoted and implemented, and by the way, all land grant universities throughout the entire country, I think almost all the states, they do promote this integrated pest management approach. But, uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, the only correct wording is shown there is the first one in bold, integrated pest management. But people play around with that acronym. You know, I, I actually like the integrated plant management there, the second one, and the, and the innovative and the improved and the intelligent, they're all kind of clever, you know, manipulations of the, of the I of the acronym, but, uh, just the only one that is correct is the one at the first. I think what people, some of them struggle with that term integrated pest management. Maybe they thought it sounded a little bit too scientific or, or too technical. And so they wanted to make it more understanding to the, 
the average homeowner. And that's why sometimes these landscape companies will will play and play around with the acronym. Okay. And so really the Yes. Um, we've had this discussion before, but yeah. uh, I prefer the term plant healthcare. Right. Because, because to me, IPM, it, you know, it's a great tool and everything, but it kind of puts the emphasis on the past. That's right. Where plant healthcare, in my opinion, it, it's putting the emphasis on how to grow healthy plants. That's that correct. Yeah. That do not develop as much pest problems. Yeah, I agree with that too. And, uh, but my job title, Barry, is Integrated Pest Management uh, Field Coordinator. So I have, <laughs> I have to lean on the IPM. But no, I definitely agree with what you yep. say. And I actually have a few slides talking about, uh, a couple of slides talking about plant health care versus IPM. And so we'll, we'll get to that uh, fairly briefly. Okay. But that's the early history started. I, I don't know when that term was first actually introduced. I know it was the leaders of that were entomologists, but I think it was in the 1950s when it started, first started being used, not, you know, because the green industry, as far as landscaping in 1950s, there really wasn't much of anything going on at that time. Uh, it was in the 19, late 1980s, that uh, mid to the 80s, and not really until the 1990s that most uh, landscape companies really began to be aware of this term and, and maybe attempt to implement. But there are many different uh, practice areas that, where this whole philosophy, and it is a philosophy, you have to emphasize that. You know, landscape and turf is where uh, I got my start. Now I'm working with nursery and greenhouse, but Rutgers has a vegetable IPM program. They also, Rutgers has a fruit IPM program, and there's school IPM program and structural indoor pests where oftentimes they focus on things like uh, baits and traps where they attempt, to, especially in schools, to eliminate the use of any kind of uh, pesticide whatsoever. So uh, anyway, it's not just the uh, landscape, but that's what I'm emphasizing tonight, okay? And so why did it become important? Uh, well, the overuse of synthetic pesticides, I kind of probably already at least somewhat talked about all this stuff, but the increased environmental awareness, somebody drove the IPM, uh, you know, acceptance and these alternative products that became available. You know, the chemists have been really clever over the last few decades to develop uh, some of these materials that are, are reduced risk or even more so with a lot of plant and animal oils, there would be minimum risk type of uh, insecticides. And I, I do, again, I'm, I'm emphasizing insecticides, but IPM also includes the use of of fungicides and herbicides and uh, a lot of plant health care cultural practices as well. So, uh, and then, you know, really all this is doing is improving the professional image of, of agricultural and uh, landscape managers and improve public relations as well. You know, we just had recently, uh, the neonicotinoids have had some poor public image now for a good number of years, uh, a good, percentage of the nurseries that I work with have attempted to stop using the neonicotinoids over the last four or five years or so. You know, the, the image uh, initially was that these neonicotinoids were killing off the honeybees and causing honeybee decline disorders. Uh, they can contribute to it, but they're certainly not the primary cause of the honeybee reduction. But the, the use of these systemics, uh, they can cause pollinator disruptions and uh, they may produce sublethal uh, doses which may be creating behavior problems with some of our pollinators and that's the same with uh, the honeybees but actually honeybees it's uh, varroa mites are more than likely and just habitat loss is another big problem with honeybees and why the reductions have been occurring over the last uh, you know, 15, 15 years or more but uh, anyway all right. And so the IPM goals are just simply to reduce the pesticide load. And hopefully, if you're going to use the pesticides, to use the more reduced risk or the minimum use or minimum risk type pesticides. Uh, and then ideally, if you're doing your applications against a pest early on, 
there hasn't been much damage yet. They haven't built up large populations. Oftentimes you're trying to catch them when they're young, uh, immature nymphs or larvae, or even sometimes the egg stage. And, uh, you know, we can do tests and damage before they even start. And, uh, you know, the, by reducing some, you know, I work in greenhouses, like I've indicated, those who have a tendency to over apply pesticides, it can affect the, the appearance of a lot of the flowers. It can create, a, you know, maybe not a total phytotoxicity, but it, uh, the flowers can be at least slightly damaged. And so and they're applying these materials sometimes when it's maybe not necessary. And so, uh, but certainly uh, improved pest controls is the bottom line. And it's just the fact that we're monitoring for them and we're trying to determine when is the, the best time to control them before they cause damage and when they're easiest to control. And then we can use these more reduced risk type pesticides and get pretty good efficacy. So that's, that's part of the goals that we attempt to do with the IPM approach. And so the big thing, um, you know, when Barry and I, in my earlier years with Rutgers and I first started, the thing is just to stop this common practice that many of the landscape professionals had. And this was the routine thing was just to do cover sprays, you know, just spray everything down, essentially producing a chemical umbrella, which really wasn't necessarily always required. And I would have, when I, was working for a company in my really early years, I would do the more of a monitoring and be selectively treating. And then, but the thing is sometimes some of the clients would, they were kind of more anticipating you to do what had been done in the past where they kind of thought of you as an exterminator and not a plant manager. And they would say, well, gosh, I saw you looking at some of the plants but you didn't spray them with your, with your magic uh, chemical. <laughs> they didn't say that, but uh, I would often say, well, it'd be irresponsible and unprofessional for me to just routinely spray materials on plants that didn't require. And I make that decision. And, and the thing is, did they have enough respect for the uh, landscaper to make that kind of decision? And uh, part of the problem with the industry, I'm getting bit on a tangent here because I won't be able to cover nearly enough material, but uh, it, there's there's a great deal of turnover in the green industry. And so oftentimes the people that are on the landscapes, they have minimal experience or, you know, with a big company, a big landscape production company, it's been shown that oftentimes they have 50% turnover a year. And so there's not a pretty good chance that if you have the higher, I shouldn't I didn't say this, but uh, with these bigger companies, if they do production type and they're not doing IPM, there's a good chance that uh, the person is on the property. It's it's it's, it's their first year. Yeah, there, there's a there's a big problem with employment at the, at this time. Uh, past couple of years, it's it's really been horrible finding any kind of employees. But I, I wanted to ask you, Steve. Um, you know, I, I, obviously, yes, I was mostly in tree care, and you know what I saw with tree care is that. Um, over the years, it did gradually move away from cover sprays to doing spot treatments after being scouting and everything. But I haven't seen the same kind of thing happen in the lawn care industry. It's everybody has set programs or spraying the same thing at certain times of the year and, and there's no monitoring or anything going on. I think that's probably a very good assessment. It's and no doubtedly true. Uh, you know, to do monitoring in turf uh, is perhaps a bit more time consuming, Barry, because the fact that you often have to look very closely and um, and, and do uh, maybe even subsoil type of uh, you know, scouting or monitoring, especially with grubs. And I, I would argue with that. I, I think tree care is much more complicated. You're dealing with all different kinds of species. Oh, yeah. Right? Rather than a uh, monoculture. <laughs> I know, but the thing is, as far as with turf, and one of the reasons I think the the difficulty they have with monitoring is the fact that um, it it's, has such a large area, and uh, they have to get really close to monitor. Yeah. We're talking about things like sod webworms and chinch bugs and white grubs and bluegrass bill bugs. And uh, oftentimes if the populations are low, you're not gonna detect their presence. 
And so you'd have to look really closely. And, and what happens is that with that type of a turf approach, you're, you're doing a, well, there's certainly differences with white, white grubs because now, you know, they're gonna more than likely, I don't know if they're gonna have the ability to use the neonicotinoids anymore on turf. Have you heard about that? I have not yet. The neonicotinoids, things like merit. Yep. And things that uh, certainly affect pollinators like clover. So right. there could be more restrictions of when you can apply the, the merit. Um, but it does last many weeks. And so uh, it's still going to affect the pollinators in some effect, but I'm getting there, a little there, there are other options. We, we had um, yeah, one sure. of our other speakers was talking about the, the BT formulation for grub control. Yeah. yeah, in fact, you know, the BT, uh, there was a product that they were all set to release. It was called Booey Booey. And <laughs> it was, but they, uh, they discontinued to even attempt to release it when the neonicotinoids and merit, uh, merit came out. And this was in back in 1995. And so they were all set to release the BT and then they realized they couldn't compete with the merit. Right. So that's what happened there. So I, did, I, didn't, I, didn't, yeah, I didn't know that. I have a dog named Bowie. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So anyway, uh, getting back, uh, you know, we're trying to do more selective uh, treatments. And you know, the way we do is by monitoring, knowing where to treat and when to treat and if it's necessary. And this is uh, you know, the broadcast on the left and the more target selective tree treatments there shown on the right. And so that's, that's the focus of the, the approach with monitoring. So monitoring does take a little bit of time, but you, know, you get pretty efficient at it and you know which plants to look at at certain times of the year because you learn you know, those plants, they're gonna have certain problems at certain times. And, and there are you know, some, some plants that you, you just know they're gonna have problems. And so you really zero in on those are called key plants and you just uh, focus on those and maybe the ones that are less pest prone, you don't have to spend as much time on. And so anyway, so, but the, you know, that's just monitoring, you know, IPM is a lot more involved than just simply monitoring and then selectively spraying pesticide. That's the very big first step. And that's back in the 1990s when uh, that's what everyone was attempting to at least initially do. And so that, that step was made by many of the uh, landscape companies. And so uh, that's still not universal. There's still many who do uh, broadcast cover calendar treatments. So IPM is an inform, I don't need to read this, but uh, I just will go ahead and say that really basically increasing the tools in your toolbox is what IPM does. And it's uh, an informed sustainable approach based on uh, trying to control insects, diseases, weeds, and other pests as well. That's just a, a sampling of them. And by doing these cultural, uh, biological, chemical uh, type tactics, and uh, we want to try to minimize the uh, economic health and environmental risks that we have. And so that's that's the whole part of the IPM approach. And so this is, yeah, go ahead, Barry. I, I don't know if you saw me holding up the... Oh, yeah, wow, that goes back. <laughs> that was... Oh, let me see. Probably 1990s. 1993. Yeah. 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 Yep. So, um, John Raffiani has a question. Um, okay. He wants to know if you would agree that the current continuing education requirements for pesticide license renewals are too simplistic. Oh, well, you know, um, I think what they want primarily with a lot of this certification is they want to make sure that people are aware of being able to read the label, the chemical label, the pesticide label to you know, realize you know, what's required when you apply a certain specific pesticide. And so that's what a lot of this testing is designed to do. You, know, you have to be able to read a label. And that's the problem with someone like a homeowner, residential homeowner, who perhaps doesn't want to take the time to do that. Hopefully they will, but some maybe don't. And so uh, that's, that's the, at least the goal with the whole certification, I believe, is to really encourage the applicators to, to read the label and do things properly. 
because they have to protect their, their license as if they repeatedly abuse it and you know, then they could potentially lose their license. Stephen, we have a we have a question in the chat um, from John Raffiani, and he would like to know um, if you would agree that the current continuing education requirements for pest license renewals are too simplistic. Yeah, Barry just asked me that question, and I was oh. uh, I pretty much answered. I hope uh, so. Yeah, I mean they're designed to be very simplistic, and should they be more complex and more comprehensive? Oh, undoubtedly yes. Uh, I couldn't disagree with. I could not. You know, disagree with that statement that he made, but the, the purpose of the, the license is to make sure that the labels are read. In fact, if you be able to pass the test, oftentimes you, you're forced to, I don't, it's been, gosh, I, I first took that pesticide exam back in 1982, <laughs> and I still have the same license, but as I remember Back then, you were forced to answer questions by reading parts of labels. Is that is that correct about that? That's still yeah, done. Sure. I don't know if it's still done, but it was done when we do it. Yeah, but uh, we're talking uh, forty years ago, Barry. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. So, um, yeah, and so cultural, and and also when I say cultural, I, I have a slide that kind of emphasizes some of these cultural aspects, and really that this is this is plant healthcare. The cultural, a lot of physical and mechanical, and then the biological is just uh, being aware of, of the beneficials that are present, the backyard beneficials and the parasitoids and the predators, and what they look like, and not necessarily thinking that they're pests and they need to be destroyed, and then uh, seeing uh, what their ratios are, if there are enough of them to maybe make an impact. And then the chemical, of course, is something that's still used, but as I've already emphasized, we, we're trying to use the more reduced risk. And the thing is, is these alternative products, they, they keep coming out, these chemists are pretty clever. They keep coming out with these new, these new materials. And you know, unfortunately, that many of them tend to be quite expensive, uh, but often over time, that, that price will reduce. But these newer materials, uh, used to be an old commercial. It was a Brill, Brill Cream, hair lotion commercial. And I think it stated basically, a little dab will do you. I don't Barry, you remember that? Yeah. A, little, a little dab will do you. Back, back when we had hair. Yeah. Oh yeah, I don't, I don't worry about that anymore. But uh, yeah, that, uh, you know, so these materials, even though they're expensive, they go a long way, but you do have that expensive upfront cost, which, you know, some people you know, object to, and so. Right, and so this is just a real simplistic uh, diagram of, you know, really what I, IPM attempts to do. The monitoring and the cultural decisions is the, is the central core. You might liken it to the um, the the axis of a of a of a wheel or two wheels together, and then uh, based on the information you gather, you make a decision if does an intervention needs to occur, and then you use these cultural, biological, or chemical approaches, or maybe in some cases you used all of them. And so let's see if we can get to what the cultural are. Here we are. Here's here's the one. And, and I often cultural controls, and I have with a question mark PHC. And so a lot of these are certainly plant health care type approaches, and uh, you know, oftentimes they're done incorrectly by people who are not knowledgeable enough, uh, you know, proper pruning techniques and irrigation and fertilizing and mowing. <laughs> These are all PHC type approaches. Mulching, of course, the mulching volcanoes is still prevalent throughout the, the landscape uh, too often. And, uh, you know, soil amendments, things like biostimulants, uh, plant selection, resistant plants, proper planting site. And these are all really key plan health care approaches. And it really, you might say that anything that reduces uh, plant stress is a cultural practice. And uh, it's often not any pesticides required whatsoever. And so that's just kind of a simplistic review of, of cultural controls. And then is there a difference between IPM and PHC? Well, I, I don't know. And, and some, some of this, I think, could be speculative and maybe people don't necessarily totally agree with it, but I think IPM, landscape IPM evolved from crop farming that initiated kind of back in the 1950s. Landscape was kind of a latecomer in this uh, approach. 
And then maybe you might say that PHC evolved out of landscape IPM. In fact, uh, the American Society of Arboriculture initially back in the 1980s, they did attempt landscape IPM, but they decided to stop that. And that's when they, I believe, introduced the term PHC or plant healthcare. They, you know, they felt that, uh, you know, IPM was difficult to market to their clients. And uh, people under kind of maybe have a better intuitive understanding of plant healthcare. And so, uh, so does PHC equal IPM? Or is it more than just a new marketing angle? You know, as Barry already indicated, uh, IPM historically has focused on the pest, whereas plant health care directs the focus more on the plant. And I, I actually kind of like that approach even better. So you might say to be kind of a compromising statement that PHC assists with IPM and IPM assists with PHC. What do you think, Barry? Would you buy that? Is it I'll okay? go for that. I'll go for that. All right. Nice compromise. See, uh, politics sometimes does work. <laughs> All right. And so biological controls is something that, you know, in the landscape, it's, uh, it's probably more just recognition and not augmentation. Uh, I have uh, greenhouse growers, some of them who have attempted to do augmentation where they actually release beneficials into the greenhouse. And they've had really good success if you, if you do it with a lot of background information and maybe have a consultant that works with you. And uh, we have things like predators and parasitoids that are released. Predators are ones we're not familiar with, things like praying mantids and lady beetles and lace wings and serpent flies and so forth. Whereas the parasitoids are typically wasps, although some of them are flies. Uh, and they're, they're not wasps that we need to worry about. They're tiny, tiny wasps. And uh, what they do is they lay eggs within the uh, within the aphid or maybe within the caterpillar or within the scale and uh, they basically eat the, from the inside out or sometimes some parasitoids will lay their eggs right next to a pest and then they eat uh, from the outside in but those are parasitoids that can be very effective and and then pathogens uh, one of our very most successful use of pathogens has been against these now the spongy moth those who are listening or didn't hear before, you know, the gypsy moths are now officially been called, at least the common name, the scientific name hasn't changed, but the common name and now is spongy moth. And apparently gypsy moth had kind of a negative connotation to it. And so that's the reason that why they use the term spongy moth is because the eggs kind of have a spongy appearance to it. And so it does make some sense to it. But the pathogen I'm talking about is, uh, uh, Entomophaga mai mai, yeah, which was released, they brought it over from, from Asia. It was a, a, it's a fungus that was found in the, primarily in the soils and on the trees where they have the Asian gypsy moth over in China and other parts of Asia. And they brought this fungus over and they released it in uh, several states. They attempted it early on in the earlier part of the 20th century. It didn't really seem to be successful. And they attempted it again in the 1980s. And this time it worked, and they released it in the uh, you know parts of uh, Massachusetts and New York and Virginia, and it really spread uh, like wildfire. And so this is a pathogen that was really very successful at suppressing the gypsy moths. Okay, All right. again, when you do these exotic uh, you know classical type of biological controls, that's something obviously that the the private citizen or commercial landscapers could not do themselves. That has to be done by, uh, you know, officially approved uh, researchers and uh, the government uh, sponsored. Okay. And so these are the biological control options. You got conservation, which I think is really what landscape is, is up to now. Conservation, greenhouses doing augmentation. And of course, importation is something that's very selective and is more research uh, and uh, government uh, sponsored. And so uh, IPM chemical controls are still used. And we've already been indicating that we treat only when necessary. We've tried to spot rather than cover treatment. So monitoring is required. You know, the key focus with IPM is monitoring. If you don't monitor, you cannot do landscape IPM. It's just pretty much as simple as that. And then we try to use these more reduced risk pesticides. And uh, so they're just uh, 
more compatible with an IPM program, trying to, uh, I think best example would find trying to eliminate, uh, you know, impact, negative impacts against beneficial insects, as well as the environment, you know, fish and birds and, and mammals and non-targets has uh, much, much less of an impact, negative impact with these reduced risk pesticides. If you even go a step further, it's something that uh, uh, Barry is very familiar with are some of these, uh, uh, <clears throat> What is it, the 20, 24C label, Barry? 25 <laughs> minimum risk. Yeah, minimum risk tests. And, and most of those are uh, plant and animal oils. And so, and coverage is very important for those to work. And so anyway, all right, and they don't require, um, they're not, they don't have any kind of a caution label to them at all. All right, so uh, IPM fundamentals is this kind of a step-by-step -step approach. Uh, I already indicated how important monitoring is, and yet it's the second step here. What's that all about? Well, you know, to do monitoring, you have to have a bit of experience and background and, and knowledge. And so you have to recognize what you're looking at. And so that's why these big, bigger production companies sometimes will struggle with IPM because of the fact that so many, a large percentage of their staff are, are brand new from one year to the next. Surely, many of them are very experienced, but they're not enough of them sometimes. And so what some of the bigger companies, they will have just selected numbers of their more experienced people who though, who clients that want to do an IPM approach or a plant health care approach, then those select people can do that. And then they can monitor and make decisions and then intervene when it's necessary. And then, you know, do one of the cultural, biological, chemical interventions, and then evaluate, did it work or did it not? And so that's the step-by-step -step approach with IPM or, or plan healthcare. Okay. And so it's not uh, you know step-by-step. -step. I, I think I've already talked about that. I'm gonna move along. I wanna pick up my speed here just to get a few more slides in. Um, and so, you know, yeah, identifying the target pest is a key concept with IPM. Um, the disease, an insect or a weed, what have you. And that's really, really critically important because you have to know the life cycle of these insects, diseases and weeds. And, you know, also the behaviors of things like insects and, and be aware of natural enemies that can attack them and, and the host plants that are there. And so there's a lot to it. And there can be a, initially the first you know, couple of years, it really takes to get the experience, you know, to fe feel comfortable with monitoring and thinking that, you're, you're catching the problems uh, enough on an early basis and doing good controls and being effective. And then also with a, as a commercial operator to be economically viable and to make money out of it. And so that requires a little bit of efficiency and picking up your speed. And so, you know, <laughs> this is one that, uh, you know, Barry certainly did not say this when I worked with him, but I did work with one of my early years, uh, one of the Cooperators that was a landscaper and and he 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 pro he accepted the IPM approach but you know I think after a while he started getting a little frustrated because he, he was starting to get to be a little more involved than he had wanted and so he made this statement you know that are we playing chess out here <laughs> and and I, some of those one of those things I will never forget when he says and I said wow I mean it's kind of a surprising statement to make this this fellow wants to keep things as simple as possible which maybe I can understand some people wanting to do, but if you want to be a, you know, really a professional at your job, you want to be advanced and learn as much as, as you possibly can. So uh, no, it's not, it's not chess, but uh, it's certainly involved and it's, it's a scientific approach and it's a learning curve, no doubt. And so and we did a survey, it's getting a really a dated slide. And I worked with an agent in Ocean County when I was there and we had a, a landscape uh, uh, IPM newsletter and so we had a pretty good subscription. It was paid, you have to pay for it. And then we had close to almost a thousand, uh, mostly New Jersey, but they were out of state as well. But this was only for New Jersey residents or rather uh, commercial operators. We sent this newsletter uh, question to, and we asked them, uh, you know, what type of uh, practices you did with your pest management. And these are the results we came back based on how they answered the questions. And uh, there's four kind of categories we, we divided up to. And uh, we found out that at least, now there's a bias to this because they had already decided to purchase an IPM newsletter. And so they probably already accepted the approach. And if we had an impact from maybe other, you know, 
landscape companies that perhaps were not practicing IPM, they would have been skewed more to the left. But the ones that answered, we found out about 17% of them still did cover sprays. And that was more on a calendar basis. And then 29% the said they did see and spray. So they didn't monitor, but they just still, they, they, they kind of waited for the problem to show itself and they weren't looking close enough until it became obvious oftentimes. So damage was already there when they intervened. And then about 28% said that they monitored and then they made the treatment. And so that's a big first step. And then about a quarter of them, 26% actually, said that we're doing basic IPM. You know, we're monitoring, we're doing selective treatments. We're trying to use the more reduced risk, you know, uh, pesticides, and we're also looking at beneficial insects and making decisions based on, like Barry indicated with his aphid and uh, lady beetle example that he experienced with this tulip tree. Uh, they were beginning to do that type of a, a you know, understanding and, and, and utilizing the biocontrols as well. So, so is that great? No, I don't know. It's been a long time since we did a survey like this, and I no longer directly work with landscapers, and the landscape IPM program is now defunct at Rutgers. And uh, so I'm now working with Greenhouse Nursery uh, exclusively, but I still give talks to landscapers. And so I still show this slide. So, so it's a continuum IPM, it's not uh, black and white. And uh, there's a level of commitment to this approach. As you go from one to six, that level of commitment increases as you get more advanced and, you know, more experienced. And so uh, no IPM, you're chemically dependent, very low decision-making. Maybe you're doing a calendar broadcast cover treatment, which was the old history of, uh, of landscape uh, back uh, you know, 30, 40 years ago. And then maybe you attempt to do more of an IPM approach on perhaps just a few of your clients and to see how that works. Can you make money doing this? And then maybe you you establish a handful of clients that's year after year, so you have a basic approach. You know, it's, and you become established as you get more, as I indicates there, you get more advanced. It's hard to reach that sixth stage, that optimal stage, where you're culturally dependent and biologically dependent, and you're making high decision-making. Oftentimes the trouble with landscape, commercial landscape companies, is that you're not simply not gonna be on the property often enough. You know, some of them have large clienteles and they just don't have enough staff. And maybe you can at best be on a property once a month. And is that ideal for an IPM? No, it's not. You know, ideal would be, well, ideal would be daily. <laughs> and actually I did work with some uh, managers who worked on estates and they actually lived, they were provided housing on the estate, now, we're talking big money here, and their, you know, their, their employer were probably millionaires, multi-millionaires, and so they were on the site every day, and they could really do, and I had two or three of my cooperators who had this type of situation, and they could really do an IPM and do a really good job at it, and uh, because because they were there every day, and they could they can monitor things and evaluate on a daily basis. But that's not possible for a lot of many of the commercial landscape companies. They just can't be there that often. So. All right. So I see about I got about ten minutes, and uh, there's a number of things that uh, let's see how I want to review. Or re, you know, do my last few minutes here. Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't think I want to go through the resistance because it, uh, I think a lot of you understand that resistance is a potential and that the label indicates you have to change your mode of action. You can't use that same material again and again. And a lot of the pesticides and especially and not just insecticides, this includes fungicides and to an extent herbicides as well. You know, you, you have to at least periodically kind of throw a genetic curveball. At the, uh, at the host that you're trying to, uh, or, the, or the pest you're trying to control. And so uh, therefore, um, you know, uh, you wanna avoid that resistance from occurring. And, and the label does often give you resistant management mandates. You know, the label is the law. They tell you how you can use this particular product because, you know, the, the manufacturers of the, uh, any kind of a pesticide, they don't want their materials to develop resistance. And so they, they stipulate on the label how often you can 
use a particular material on the same site because uh, you want to try to avoid that resistance. Where does uh, resistance occur more often? It's in the greenhouse. I mean, it, there are reports of landscape resistance with certain pests occurring, but it's much more common in the greenhouse. And you can maybe understand why, because they have a, a, a at least a semi-enclosed type of an environment where the pests aren't you know, moving in and out freely. And so there's a much higher tendency if you use that same active ingredient on that same pest population over and over again, you're, they're gonna be exposed to, and you're forcing the, the insects to, to change. You know, there's, there's always a variety in an insect or you know, weeds and you know, even diseases. There's, there's populations, uh, there has, there's, there's genetic variability. And so what you're doing is all, all you're like using that same mode of action, you are eliminating the ones that are susceptible to the chemical, but that maybe initially very small percentage that have a maybe some kind of a genetic resistance to it. But with insects, it's often enzymes or complex number of enzymes that only a very small percentage have these enzymes. However, if you keep using the same mode of action again and again, you're forcing that population to change. And the only ones that are successfully reproducing are the ones that contain this, these resistant uh, capabilities, these enzymes. So that's what happens is that- uh, so, uh, John has another question. It says many products coming out are dual use pesticides, fungicide combos uh, to address the same amount of time spent on sites. And, do you see any downside to these type of applications? Wow. You know, I've heard very much more knowledgeable people than I am give their thoughts on this. And I tell you, Barry, it's frustrating because it's variable with their responses. And it's frustrating to know, you know, I mean, now fortunately in the landscape, we don't have nearly the resistance taking place Greenhouse is the big problem. In fact, one of the reasons why, to be honest with you, I can't answer that question you, you provided to me. And the thing is, I've had that question being asked at these conferences that I attend with you know, very uh, knowledgeable individuals and leaders, true leaders in the industry. And there was a time a few years ago where these two very well-recognized leaders were going at each other with that question, one saying it was a problem, another saying it wasn't. <laughs> and so what are we supposed to do as we were listening, watching these two guys going out and they were getting angry with each other. And so I've kind of kind of steered away from that, answering that question because basically I don't know. However, in the greenhouse, uh, it's one of the reasons why augmentation or the use of beneficial insect releases is becoming more and more commonly done. And that's the wave of the future in the greenhouse uh, is the use of augmentation and, and beneficial, you know, predators and parasitoids. And there's been some really outstanding success stories. In fact, this, this afternoon, I was at a greenhouse, uh, a QPAC greenhouse, uh, which is outside of, you know, Allentown, New Jersey, and they're one of the leaders in the state with using biocontrols, and they've been doing it now for the last half dozen or more years quite successfully. And they occasionally will have to go with, uh, you know, hopefully some compatible uh, insecticides where it's needed to try to help re uh, reduce the amount of negative impact they have on the beneficials. But there are times when they still need to intervene periodically. But that's the wave of the future with uh, the use of. Uh, with greenhouse beneficials. And uh, so, yeah, difficult question. Was it John that answered that question? Uh, yep. That's a difficult question. It's really complex. And I'm not the person to uh, answer that. <laughs> so, I don't know, Barry, do you have any comments? Maybe you could. <laughs> no, I don't. Okay. <laughs> uh, Steven, this is Rachel. I'm just kind of curious. Um, well, first off, I know that the fungicides can oftentimes be most damaging to the to the soil. At least uh, you might want to get that confirmed. But according to my house guest, that is the case. And um, 
I wonder if the industry, what would be the appropriate feedback loop when you do see a problem? Where would you go if you were uh, an applicator and you're like, look, I'm noticing this. What's the appropriate um, recourse or, or feedback loop to give, where, where do you tell, who do you tell? Yeah, you made that comment about fungicides and the negative impacts. Um, I mean, there's certainly some very beneficial fungi that's in the soil and various types of microorganisms. And, and fungi have actually been shown, uh, fungicides, rather fungicides, I should say, have been maybe more detrimental to honeybees than insecticides. That's been research that especially, you know, more recently come out and oftentimes insecticides is being blamed, you know, especially the neonicotinoids being blamed for the honeybee decline disorder where maybe the bigger impact are from fungicides with honeybees. And uh, as far as soil impacts and the microorganisms in the soil, I mean, that's, you know, again, kind of a little, little bit out of my area of expertise that's probably more toward Barry's expertise than mine, but certainly uh, you have microorganisms in the soil that could be negatively impacted by fungicides, you know? Yeah, it's my understanding of all the classes of pesticides, fungicides do the most damage to the, to the soil. Yeah. Yeah. Now there's some entomopathogenic uh, fungi that are beneficial. I mean, one of the best are the endophytes. <laughs> That's where, you know, they have a, a symbiotic relationship with turf grass. And right. Except for Kentucky bluegrass, they move into the, uh, into the blades of perennial ryegrass and fine fescue and, and uh, I'm missing one. Uh, uh, but anyway, they are you know, they're fungi that uh, deter feeding by insects like chinch bugs and, and sod webworm and, and so forth, bluegrass billbug. They don't move into the roots though, and so they're not affecting against their white grubs. But yeah, fungi can also sometimes be beneficial, of course, as, as Barry knows very well. And uh, a lot of his biostimulants uh, promote some of these you know, the benefits of mycorrhizae and so forth that uh, it's quite, uh, it's been around and that kind of research has been around now for decades and it's still, uh, a lot of research is still being done and improvements and more knowledge is being done all the time. So uh, anyway. Yeah, well, I don't know if you saw it, Steve, but what, one of our first uh, presenters was uh, Dr. White talking about uh, microorganisms and how the plants interact. Um, yeah, he's a Rutgers professor, isn't he? Yes, he is. Yeah, yeah, and actually I remember learning about endophytes from Dr. White, you know, probably 30 years ago. Well, endophytes first came out for use in commercial uh, grass seed, uh, I think it was around uh, 1990. And uh, Dr. White, I think, was involved with that. He was a very young professor at that time. And uh, he was involved with some of that research, I believe, with the, uh, the introduction of the endophytes into the seeds, inoculating the seeds of the grass. Yes. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad the conversation kind of went this way because um, um, when when you're done, I have a closing comment that I yeah we'll blend well, right in with this. <laughs> let's see what I can close with, Barry. Um, let's see what I can. I don't know if I can move my slides around here. Um, just to, as far as resistance, uh, the speed of potential resistance, the number of generations per season, the greater number and the number of offsprings per generation, when those numbers are greater than potential resistance uh, will be more likely to occur. And um, a good example would be things like spider mites and aphids. Certainly you do have resistance occurring. Definitely in the greenhouse, aphid resistance to some insecticides, uh, you know, white flies certainly in greenhouse as well. They're all having problems with uh, resistance. And that's again, I'll repeat myself why the the future with greenhouse, especially with insecticides and uh, insect pests are going to be with these beneficials and the releasing. And that that's advancing uh, at a pretty fast rate. And so I, I, I would I would guess if I was a gambling person, 20 years in greenhouses 
the augmentation of beneficial insects will be routine. It'll be standard. It's moving that direction pretty quickly, but it's still, it still takes a lot of learning. And uh, so our greenhouse growers will have to be more educated about it. Okay. All right. Uh, so um, I don't know if I can do this one last thing, Barry, uh, the yeah, primary go, pest go resurgence. Yep. Uh, and this is one where, uh, the reason I slow that slide here, that's a two-spotted spider mite. As, as far as the landscape in the summer period, that's a warm season mite. And so that's our cosmopolitan mite that feeds on a lot of different plants, especially, you know, not only, I think the sentinel plant for landscapers with the two-spotted spider mite is the, uh, uh, the winged euonymus or the burning bush. They, they, they get this two-spotted spider mite and uh, if it defoliates the leaves of the burning bush, uh, oftentimes by July or August, especially if in August, those leaves are not coming back. And so you won't have that nice red color in the fall. And so about two spotted spider mites and what the problem is, if you do a, a broad spectrum chemical and uh, you do it too often, especially, but even if it's just, uh, you know, without doing monitoring, what can happen? You know, if you just apply this calendar broadcast spray, you're not paying attention. Uh, maybe you maybe you don't even notice. Yeah, there's maybe some mites there, and you're not monitoring very closely. You don't pay attention, and uh, and and you make this application with that black arrow as shown. This is another X Y graph with the density on the Y axis going up with the higher density of either the pest or the beneficials, and the time moving from left to right. And then there's the threshold that the uh, that the dotted dash dash line. That's this uh, subjective number where the pest, if it reaches and goes beyond that density, then perhaps it exceeds the landscape, that 10% threshold, and maybe it's gonna be causing some aesthetic damage to the plant that's still being noticed, and uh, your clients are gonna complain. And so you wanna try to keep the pests below that threshold level. And in this case, the beneficials there, it could have been predaceous mites, not the pre, not pre, uh, not uh, pest mites, they're actually beneficial mites, or things like, um, you know, minute pirate bugs and green lace wings and lady beetles and so forth. They all maybe work in complex, all keeping the, in this case, this, this two-spotted spider mite that's in red, keeping it from getting above the threshold. And so it was doing a nice job. Maybe you have a little waxing and, and waning as the, the beneficials are, you know, they move and respond with the pest as well as with their numbers. But then you would disrupt everything. You had a, you really had a dynamic equilibrium that was established. But then you destroy it with a broadcast cover treatment and everything is disrupted. Okay, sure. You knock the pipe, the mites down. Maybe you didn't even know the mites were there. Uh, and then what you do to the beneficials is even more probably devastating. And you know, over time that pesticide is going to wear off. It may be a week, two weeks or so. And then suddenly the um, the residual is low enough where the, the two-spotted spider mites are not negatively affected so much. And then they can start reproducing again. However, there's always going to be a time lag with the beneficials and, and many of our parasitoids and predators, they're often gonna be more sensitive to the a broadcast chemical than the actual target is. One of the reasons why is because these beneficials are moving around and they're getting, getting exposed. And, uh, and so you know, maybe you've missed some areas with the, with the two spotted spider mites. And so those areas start to reproduce quite rapidly because there's no more beneficials keeping them suppressed. And where before you didn't need to make a treatment, now the, the two spotted spider mites exceeds that threshold. Yes, the beneficials are responding, but there's, they do it much more slowly and they can't establish that equilibrium until after the damage become unacceptable. And so therefore you have to do a spray where before you didn't. And so that's the problem. That's called primary pest resurgence. And uh, certainly things like aphids and spider mites and uh, those other pests as well that all have this type of a problem. Also things like scale insects, armored scales is very prone to this. And yeah, John, 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 John just had it. Yeah, he had oh, a comment. Ahead. He wanted to know if the insecticidal soaps are more useful for mites. Well, uh, insecticidal soaps with coverage can uh, be a pretty decent suppression. Uh, 
Uh, yes, they can. Uh, the key thing with these types of contact materials is you have to get the coverage. And, and, uh, and so that's the key thing. Yeah, and the timing. Yeah. Oh, true, true. You know, I don't want them build up. You know, um, I was at a greenhouse uh, last week where there was a new grower who didn't have a lot of experience. He was just brand new in the, uh, in the greenhouse grower. He's, and uh, he was actually, a, his, he was a contractor <laughs> and he, what, he dabbled, started wanting to dabble in the greenhouse. And so he contacted uh, my office and asked if I would help out. And so sure enough, but the one thing he did is he allowed um, he a lot of these Calabacoa plants all hanging baskets and they're, they're notorious for things like thrips and also aphids. And what he should have done with all greenhouse growers do is they do a preventative treatment because they know those plants are so pest prone that they do a preventative to prevent them from building up. Because what happened is that, uh, you know, by the time I got there, probably the reason why he called me is that his population was just out the roof. And so he, now he had to do a chemical catch-up. And he, he, had, he did make an application and I told him he needed to do it. Otherwise you're not gonna be able to sell these plants because the honeydew was starting to drip all over them. And then black sooty mole was beginning to grow. And, and he's, he's opening up his business uh, to the public on May 1st. And he's got a good percentage of his plants are these calabacoa that were almost all of them infested. And so he's got to do catch up and it's going to be a difficult time for him to get that population dropped down low enough again. So he'll be able to successfully sell them. So he may have to wait uh, you know, another week or two before he can sell those particular plants. So that's a, that's a key factor and uh, not it's as Barry mentioned starting early. Um, I know I got 10 after I don't know if I wanted to take five minutes to go over secondary outpest up, uh, outbreak. This is what happens. And maybe this would be a good thing to finish with um, because scales in particular armored scales are probably the most difficult pest in the landscape to, I think Barry would probably agree with me, to control. Uh, they do have a waxy cover that gives them a really good protection. There's other types of families of scales, another group of scale called the soft scales and the felt scales and the gall-like scales, but they're, they don't have these waxy cover protections. This armored scale group of species is the only ones that have this. And so it makes timing so critical because we wanna make sure we know the species of scale and when the crawlers are gonna be coming active. Armored scales, some of them have one generation a year, and so we, we can maybe time our treatments pretty well. Some of them have two generations a year, makes it a little more problematic, and then some have actually three generations a year. And so maybe the crawlers are active almost the entire season. And so what was going wrong with these is that, uh, I don't know if Barry experienced this himself with his experience in the landscape and doing broadcast cover treatments. I don't know if he did that or not, but I know I did with the company I first started in 1980. This is what we did. And uh, you know maybe you had a primary pest, which is maybe the two spotted spider mites again. Then we have the the secondary pest, in this case, maybe it's the armored scales, okay? Then we also have beneficials, and we're not talking about one, we're having a complex number of beneficials, and with scales, the parasitoids are really critical. They can do an outstanding job of suppressing scales. In fact, without parasitoid, and most of them are gonna be wasps, we would really not probably be capable of controlling the armored scales with our chemicals. We would be spraying constantly and I don't know what the resistance problem may have eventually occurred. But anyway, this graph shows you what happens in this case. When you do an unnecessary treatment, which is what we did a lot, because we weren't even aware necessarily the scales were there. And we would come in, the beneficials again, were establishing this, this dynamic equilibrium Thresholds were not being exceeded by either the, the scales or the mites or whatever other, other insect pests there may be there. But then we come in there with a the pesticide, we disrupt everything. However, with the armored scales, unless we're treating the crawlers many times with a good percentage of our pesticides at least, they're not gonna control the armored scales unless they're the crawler stage. And so if we're missing the crawler stage, and many times 
I know we did in our early years, we were promoting scale insects with our cover brand cast, you know, cat counter type treatments. And we can see what happened here is uh, you know, the same thing. The beneficials are being knocked way low. There's that time lag. Yes, the two spotted spider mites in red started picking up or, or any other type of pest perhaps picking up their abilities. And the scale just kept on going almost immediately. And then uh, that really created the problem. We were promoting armored scales with these broadcast cover treatments. And so yeah, I, I was I was trained. There was a number of, of key plants, and and I was trained that you, you sprayed them every visit, no matter what. <laughs> yeah, and you know maybe it's maybe that would be successful, but you have to know what's there, and if you've got scales there and you're not looking for the crawlers and whatever material you're having to use, it's probably a good chance it will not be controlling the, the scales. Uh, it's easy to control the crawlers. A jet stream of water will knock off the crawlers. And so the thing <laughs> is though, with armored scales, there may be these crawlers have an extended crawler period. They don't all hatch out at once. And so if you're gonna go with something like an oil, which is very effective against crawlers, you may have to do multiple treatments. And so that's maybe difficult for some people to do. But this is showing you, uh, this is a calcid wasp. It's a female using her ovipositor and laying an egg inside the scale. It's the profile, like a sideway profile of a scale. And I think maybe I need to end with this slide, Barry, and we can all stop. This is showing you what happens with the, uh, uh, this problem with, uh, you know, the impacts of parasitoids with, in this case, uh, comparing oil versus, these are two now no longer used materials in the landscape, diazinon or Dursban, uh, but pyrethroids are now often used in the landscape and they do the same thing. They'll knock out the parasitoids really well. And you can see what happens. It takes, you know, even four weeks later, the number of traps per day of the wasps were reduced significantly, you know, by 70, 80, 90% sometimes. And the oil did very minimal impact to the beneficials. And so that's why oil, when you can use it, and if it's gonna be safe on a particular plant that you're using and it's not too hot and not too humid, then you can go with an oil or, you know, be on the safer side, maybe even 1% or less because you could still get good control with, against the crawlers with the good coverage. So uh, Stephen, just showing you again, yeah. Um, here's a question from John Raffiani um, about um, are systemic applications useful with scales? Yeah, there are some uh, very effective ones. Oh, the good, there's a handful of the neonicotinoids <laughs> that are quite effective against the armored scales. You know, and, and as you, most of you, if you've been in the industry, you now know that uh, New Jersey is at least in the residential landscapes, uh, they're gonna prohibit the use of the neonicotinoids after 2023. And the homeowners can use it this year, but then you can, they're gonna become reduced risk. I mean, they're gonna become uh, restricted use. And then you have to have a commercial license to use it in 2023. And the question that I now have, and I don't know if it's been answered yet by you know, D, DEP of New Jersey, New Jersey DEP, is there gonna be exceptions allowed for some of these invasive uh, things like spotter lanternfly? Because the dinotephron, which is safari, it's a very effective against the spotter lanternfly. If you're trying to get good suppression, it works exceptionally well. Now, is that gonna be also no longer available? Uh, I don't know if there may be um, you know, special permitting required that you have to receive, you know, you know it's gonna maybe just be a restricted use and it's, it won't be allowed to be routine, re, rout, routinely used any of these neonicotinoids anymore. And so, uh, I mean, a lot of people in the green industry were very saddened by this because the neonicotinoids are such an effective material and especially against you know, some of our armored scales. And uh, so we still have to go after the crawlers. And, uh, and so that, that's still uh, a problem now that, the, you know, that some of the landscapers will have to encounter because uh, 
anyway. Oh, Barry, you probably have some comments on that as well. <laughs> oh, no, yeah. you covered it quite well. Thanks. Yeah. So, so, all right. I think I want to stop there. I think we're already 15 after, so we're extended too long. And uh, <laughs> yeah, no, there's there's no time limit. No, but anyway, no, I, I'll I'll yeah. stay. Uh, <laughs> you never get tired of talking. <laughs> well. Uh, <laughs> So a uh, great presentation, a lot of great information. Um, it brought me back to memories of my early days and everything. Um, so you know, like one, one thing that I see, um, uh, IPM and plant healthcare can, can work very, very well, but the industry has historically, and even more so now, having trouble finding and keeping employees that are capable of doing these kind of services. So, I mean, they, they, they have trouble hiring enough people to, to mow the grass these days. So that it's, 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 it's very much especially doing IPM. Um, and there, there are certainly a lot of um, better products, I would say these days that are, yeah. are safer for everybody and everything, but, but still, it's a very small percentage of companies that are going to be capable of, of providing these kind of services. Um, so it's one thing that I've pushed over the years is that, and, and this goes back to the beginning where IPM and, and plant healthcare, you know, I, I focus on growing healthy plants. And to me, that means improving the soils and all the, the microbes and everything that are going on in there. And the healthier plants you grow, the less problems you are likely to have. It's not gonna solve everything, but um, it's certainly easier to do than uh, training people and, and maintaining them as employees to go out and do it. Um, it it's different in the, um, the greenhouse industry for sure, because everything depends on what they do there and it's a closed system, but um, no, okay. all, all the information you gave was great. And I, I look forward to seeing you again once we get out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I routinely uh, talk to uh, some regional managers of these large production companies. I don't need to mention them. There's a, a number of them. And they always confide in me that their biggest problem is turnover. Yeah. And uh, they've, they've stated that 50% per year is not unusual. Right. And so for them to be able to have enough people to do an IPM approach, they, they can't, only a certain percentage of their, their staff have that experience. And, you know, when I began in the industry, uh, I just naturally kind of evolved toward monitoring and doing selective treatments. Only one of the selfish reasons is I just wanted to avoid any unnecessary exposure to myself because uh, we were back then, Barry, we were spraying nerve poisons predominantly, you know, the organophosphates and <laughs> even, they even had some chlorinated hydrocarbons around back in that earlier right. years. And now they're being pretty much, uh, you know, one by one are being eliminated or at least st strongly restricted, especially in residential areas and so um and, and uh, it's you know it's just something that you just naturally realize that we we don't need to you know put these chemicals everywhere and and that's the that's a really a basic first step eye-opening thing that most people i think after a year or two understand you know uh, yeah and then maybe i'm getting too controversial here but one of the problems with some of the big commercial uh, production companies is they reward high production, which means mm -hmm. rapid movement through the landscape, uh, and they can make more money by doing that. And uh, they're they're rewarded for that type of behavior, and you're not you're not really paying attention what's out there. You're just you're just now you've now become an applicator who's chasing the dollar. And that's that's what you're doing, and that's that doesn't do much for the professionalism of of, our, of the green industry. So, right to to leave on a on a negative note. <laughs> yeah. 
You're so uplifting, Steve. Yeah, that's terrible. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I'm, I'm basically. Okay. So, yeah. well, okay, we're gonna we're gonna put an end to this. Yes, Thanks yes. again, Steve, very much. Before I say anything more. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't have anything on the agenda for next week. I have a few ideas, so you know, stay tuned, and you'll get the emails and let you know what's going to be going on. But again, thank you, everybody, and good night. Okay, Barry. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot for inviting me. Appreciate it. I enjoyed it. So. Thanks, Steve. All right. We'll see you around. Okay. Thanks, everybody. All right. Take care.